In our previous discussions on catalysis, we've considered what we normally might think of as the critical processes occurring at the surface of a catalyst, the actual reaction itself, right? The surface transformation, as well as adsorption and desorption. However, it's really important to remember that reactants can only happen as fast as reactants reach the surface or as fast as products can leave the surface with the former being much, much more common that usually the mass transport of reactants to a surface are limiting when mass transport is really, really important. And so in our lecture today, we're gonna try to take a first step in understanding how mass transport processes can really influence the way that our uh, catalytic reactors behave. Now, until now, we've always described the movement of a species in the gas phase in terms of only convection, whether we've talked about it that way or not. Because if you actually look at just the overall way that we have thought about this, right, we've normally said we have some molar flow rate or some volumetric flow rate entering. And we've said that, let's say the flow rate of A was equal to the concentration of A times the volumetric flow rate. And of course, this is the bulk concentration of A and this is the bulk volumetric flow rate. And of course, it's this move bulk movement of fluid that we would call convection. Of course, we've also always assumed that gas is only moving in one direction. And, and we're, we might even continue to do some of that throughout the course of the rest of this semester. But you know, we've, we've said that we're always only moving this way. And we're gonna call that direction, just for our conversation today, we're gonna to call this the Z direction, and we're just gonna use that in our notation. Now, if the fluid is moving just in this one direction Z, we also can define the mass flow rate of A as simply being equal to the cross-sectional area of our reactor multiplied by the flux of A, okay? And I will label these just so everybody can see them, right? So this is the cross-sectional area. And WAZ is just the flux of A. And the units are moles per meter squared times seconds. And so if we look at these two expressions, these have to be related to each other. And we actually can use that to find an expression for the flux. So we know that the flux of A in the Z direction then is just equal to the concentration of A times the volumetric flow rate divided by AC. But remember, that's the bulk flux. And in a pack bed reactor and also near the walls of a plug flow reactor, the gas has to interact with the solid. And at or near these contact points, mass transport is not typically dominated by convection. It's dominated by diffusion. And so if you just zoom in very close to the surface, and that's what I'm gonna to try to do here, what happens then is that there's some layer above the surface that you, know, you would still call this the bulk. But here, there is the diffusion layer. And it really is the thickness of this diffusion layer that ends up determining the mass transport properties of our system. And within this diffusion layer, there's two different types of diffusion that we could talk about. I mean, one is free diffusion. And if we're talking about free diffusion, what we're really saying is that there's no spatial bound. And so, because of that, its growth is unconstrained. And as the reaction happens, the concentration gradient gets bigger and bigger and bigger with time, or the concentration gradient gets more severe, which then manifests itself as the diffusion layer thickness can grow with time. However, a second type of diffusion is constrained diffusion. And there's a couple of ways to do this. One way is to engineer the geometry, something like the pore size 
in a porous particle might dictate how big the diffusion layer can get because you're certainly not gonna get bigger than the pore size. The other way to constrain diffusion is by flow. And of course, for us, that one, at least at the beginning here, is gonna be very, very important. And it ties in well with what we've been talking about so far. And under constrained diffusion, our diffusion layer thickness can be constant with time or can be set. And we actually can control that using the flow properties. And to understand that a little bit, let's actually consider a fluidized particle. Right? So let's take for our very first conversation, a hard sphere with, oh, that's not a sphere. There, that's pretty good. So let's, consume, uh, let's consider just a hard sphere. And we have you know, some, flow of CA in the bulk that's coming at the sphere. Well, obviously we can't go through it. So what are we gonna have to do? We are going to have to go around it, okay? And we know we're gonna have to do that on both sides. Now, how close do we actually get? Well, that's a really good question. Now, that's something that we're gonna look at and try to calculate over time. But we know we're gonna to get to some distance that we call this diffusion layer thickness, right? So let's consider our diffusion layer thickness, which actually should be constant, which I didn't draw so well there. So let me just fix that really quick. All right, that's better, it's not great. But as A comes here, right, we have flow and then it recombines downstream here. And really, our diffusion layer thickness is just this, set by the flow. And normally, the diffusion layer is defined as the point where the concentration is 99% of the bulk concentration. Okay. Now, inside the boundary layer, let's consider a cross-section. Okay. So let's look here at this cross section near the surface. And so if we do that, right, we know that here we have the surface, right? And we have the concentration of A on the surface. And then we have our boundary layer or our diffusion layer, okay? And so we have here, right? Z or the distance is equal to the diffusion layer thickness. And here that's equal to zero. And at the diffusion layer, we have the bulk concentration, right? So CA is approximately equal to the bulk concentration, right? And we're not gonna say 99% of the bulk concentration. We'll just say that's where it's approximately the bulk concentration. Now we're gonna take the diffusion inside of this layer as being Fickian diffusion, which you guys of course talked about in mass transport. And if we consider the inside of this layer, Let's look at what's happening from a mass transport perspective. So let's draw two horizontal lines here. And we're just gonna say, look, this is at Z and this is at Z plus some Delta Z, okay? And we're just some distance away. And we're gonna look at the flux of A at these two points, okay? So this is at Z. That's the flux of A at Z plus delta Z. And one of the best ways to do this, if we wanna think about it from a mass transport perspective is just to do a mass balance around this interface. And if we do that, what we know is that our mass balance is just in minus out plus the reaction terms, right? Is equal to accumulation. And we're gonna operate this thing at steady state, right? So that goes to zero, right? All of our flow reactors have operated at steady state. And remember, we're doing a mass balance here. When you're looking at a catalytic process, like we are with this hard sphere problem, the, con or the reaction only happens on the surface, right? It doesn't happen between the surface and the bulk. So this particular location where we're doing the balance, there is no reaction that's happening. And so all we're left with here is that the flow rate of A at Z 
minus the flow rate of A at Z plus delta Z is equal to zero. And that's our, our, our mass balance. And remember from just a minute ago, we already had an expression for FA and that was the flux of A in the Z direction times an area, right? So let's write this. So we know then that the flux of AZ times AC at Z minus the flux of AZ times AC at Z plus delta Z is equal to zero. And let's assume here that our cross-sectional area is equal to a constant, right? So that means that those two terms are gonna cancel. And we're left with something very simple that the flux at Z minus the flux at Z plus delta Z is equal to zero. And so let's take the limit as delta Z goes to zero. And all that means is that we now have a uh, derivative. And that is that D W A Z D Z equals zero. Okay. And we're going to use that right away because we said that we're going to assume that we have Fickian diffusion. And Fickian diffusion tells us that the flux is just equal to minus the diffusion coefficient times DCA DZ. So let's apply this equation immediately to here. And that means that the derivative of minus DAB times DCA DZ is equal to zero. Or we end up with simply just d squared ca dz squared is equal to zero, right? Because the diffusion coefficient goes away. So to solve this, what do we need? Uh, we need boundary conditions. And the best boundary conditions I think that we could choose here are the two interfaces that we've been talking about. So one boundary condition is at the surface. One boundary condition should be in the bulk. And so for our first boundary condition, we're going to say at the surface, the concentration of A just equals whatever the surface concentration is. And for our second boundary condition, we're going to say at our boundary layer that CA is equal to the bulk concentration. Okay. And so then let's solve that equation with our two boundary conditions. And if we do that, well, we know the first derivative is that you know, d c a d z is going to be equal to some constant that we call a, right? And we know then that c a is going to be equal to just a times z plus b, right? Where a and b are just constants. So if we take this and we apply boundary condition one, well, that's pretty easy because boundary condition one tells us at Z is equal to zero, that CA is CAS. So when Z is equal to zero, that's zero. And so we immediately get that B is just equal to the bulk concentration. Now let's apply the second boundary condition. Well, the second boundary condition says that the concentration at Z equal to the diffusion layer thickness is the bulk concentration. So if we apply that, we get that the bulk concentration equals A times our diffusion layer thickness plus B, right? Which is the concentration of A on the surface, okay? And so we can solve for A. So we get that A equals CAB minus CAS over the diffusion layer thickness. And so now let's take A and B, right, B and A, and just plug those in to that equation up there. And when we do that, we find that CA is equal to CAS plus CAB minus CAS times Z over the diffusion layer thickness, okay? So what about the flux? 
right? So now we have an expression for the concentration of A over a distance, right? Given a diffusion layer thickness. But remember our flux, we already said was that DAB or the flux was minus DAB times DCA DZ, right? And this was WAZ. So let's find the flux. So that means that WAZ equals minus DAB times D over DZ of CA, right? Which is CAS plus CAB minus CAS times Z over our diffusion layer thickness. And so if we look at this term by term, the first term, right? D over DZ of CAS is just equal to zero because that's a constant. The second term here, the only place that Z is located is there. And so that D over DZ is just equal to one. So we just get minus DAB then times CAB minus CAS, right? Times one over the diffusion layer thickness, right? And there's the result of our derivative. Now, if you look at the way that we defined this a moment ago, right, this is the mass transport of A out of the film, right, or away from the surface. We're mostly interested in the flux of A towards the surface, right? A is usually our reactant, right? We think of things like A goes to B. So, right, this is like away from the surface. So if we wanted to look at the flux towards the surface, Right, we would just take the opposite of that, right? And that was just a notation thing, right? And so this is towards the surface, okay? And so we actually have a definition for this because oftentimes we can't measure that directly. But if you remember from mass transport that this DAB over this diffusion layer thickness is also usually defined as the mass transfer coefficient or Kc. So that tells us that the flux towards the surface just equals Kc times this linear concentration gradient, okay? And you might even ask yourself, why is this important? Well, maybe there's a couple of reasons. First of all, the fact that we have a reaction at the surface is going to drive a concentration gradient, okay? So we know that this is gonna emerge every time we have a reaction near a surface. We also have to think that at steady state, the flux has to be equal to the reaction rate, right? And maybe that's even worth writing down. Remember, we can only, we can only react as fast as we can get things to the surface. Okay, at steady state, the flux is equal to the reaction rate. Now, how does this affect reaction rate? Okay, and maybe to wrap our heads around that a little bit, let's take a look at the simplest reaction where A goes to B. And we're gonna have a very simple process where we just have the surface reaction. So there's no adsorption of A or B, okay? And if A goes to B, well, we've been taught from the start of this semester that we know that RA is just minus K1 times CA. But here, remember, we're interested in what's happening on the surface of our particles, not what is happening um, in the bulk. Now, we might have to relate those eventually, but and actually it's a good idea to relate those eventually because we do wanna know what's happening at the broader scale. But to do that, we have to consider what's happening at a single particle. So we're not just gonna look at RA, but we're gonna look at RA double prime. And this thing is our aerial reaction rate. So this is going to link the surface area of the particles to the concentration in the bulk. Okay. 
Okay. So R A double prime, the aerial reaction rate is just equal to minus K R, which is just the aerial reaction rate constant times the concentration of A on the surface, right? Or at the surface, not on the surface, right? Because there's no adsorption here. Right. And I do want to draw a distinction here. We use C A dot S earlier this semester as representing the concentration of A adsorbed on a surface. These are different. So that's not C A dot S. This is just C A at the surface, all right, the concentration of A at the surface. If we are correct that the reaction rate of A must be equal to the flux, well, then that also means that this, um, that minus RA has to equal that, right? That's just the reaction rate equals the flux, which is what we said a moment ago. So this means that KR, CAS, this thing that we're interested in, equals KC times CA minus CAS, this thing that we derived just a moment ago. And we can get, we can combine these CAS terms. So that's CAS times KR plus KC equals Kc times Ca. And we know that then that Ca at the surface just equals Kc times the concentration of A over Kr plus Kc. And so let's just plug this thing into here, right? This is like getting the surface concentration, which we normally can't measure, as a function of a thing that we normally can measure, right? The bulk concentration of A. And so from that, we get that minus RA double prime is then equal to KR times KC times CA divided by KR plus KC. And now we're going to look at two cases. We're going to look at one where the reaction is kinetically limited. So we're going to dig into this a little bit more, right? The first case is where we're kinetically limited. And what I mean by kinetically limited is simply that the mass transport reaction rate or the mass transport coefficient is much bigger than our reaction rate constant. And the second case we're gonna look at is the opposite where the reaction rate constant is much bigger than Kc. So let's do this first where we're kinetically limited because the, the result here should make total sense to us, all right? So when Kc, is much, much greater than KR, the denominator in this really changes. So if you look at this, right, that would mean that RA prime equals KR times KC times CA divided by, and KR plus KC just becomes equal to KC. And so those cancel, and this just becomes RA double prime is equal to the reaction rate constant, the aerial reaction rate constant times the concentration of A. And this makes sense. I hope that that makes sense because what that tells us is that if you're not, if you're, if mass transport's not playing a role in how the reactor behaves, right, which is how, um, what this really means, right, that mass transport is super fast, the concentration on the surface should be much closer to the bulk concentration. And that's really the result there. All right, hopefully this makes sense. And the result of this too, is that if we look at something like the reaction rate versus flow conditions, like let's say the velocity, right? Which we're gonna call U. If the velocity were to change or you were to flow faster or slower, nothing happens to the reaction rate, right? It doesn't matter because it's not playing a role in the behavior of the reactor at that point. But that's not gonna be true for case two, which is really the meat of what we're interested in here. And that is that we are mass transport limited. And when we're mass transport limited, right, that's just the opposite of the above, right? That's just that KR is much greater or much larger than KC. And when that's the case, our expression above also simplifies in the denominator that minus RA double prime equals, right, KR Kc Ca over Kr plus Kc, but Kr is huge, right? So compared to Kc, so that becomes divided by Kr. So this just becomes Kc times Ca 
And we're going to have to then understand how KC can change with certain variables, such as the flow conditions. Okay, so how would we find KC? Well, a very common way to find KC is from the Sherwood number. And so if you remember your dimensionless variables, the Sherwood number is equal to the mass transport coefficient times the diameter of the particle over the diffusion coefficient. Now, around a sphere, we then have to be able to calculate the Sherwood number. And there are, a mul there are multiple empirical relationships that help us to do this. And we'll use a couple of them during this semester in our homework. Um, one of the very common ones is that the Sherwood number is equal to two plus 0 0.6 times the Reynolds number to the one half times the Schmidt number to the one third. And the Reynolds number, of course, is just equal to the density times the particle diameter times the fluid velocity divided by the viscosity, okay? Which is also just equal to the particle diameter times the velocity divided by the kinematic viscosity, okay? That's a very common way to find the Reynolds number. The Schmidt number is really a measurement of the momentum diffusivity over the mass diffusivity. And the Schmidt number is actually equal to the kinematic viscosity over the diffusivity, okay? Now, typically, the Schmidt number is very large for gases, okay? And so a very common simplification to make is to say, you know, this number's huge. And so we can simplify our expression for the, for the Sherwood number, right? Because then this will dwarf the two. And so for gases, oftentimes we say, that the Sherwood number is then approximately 0 0.6 times the Reynolds number to the one half times the Schmidt number to the one third, okay? And if we do that, um, we can then solve directly for KC, right? So if we know that the Schmidt number, or sorry, the Sherwood number times the Reynolds number to the one half times the Schmidt number to the one third, then equals, right, KC DP over DAB, right, from up here. Well, we can solve for KC. And we know then that KC uh, equals 0 0.6 times the Reynolds number to the one half, the Schmidt number to the one third times the diffusivity over the diameter of the particle. And maybe I'll extend that line to be over everything. And so let's make some substitutions here. Well, then KC is then equal to 0 0.6 times the DAB over the diameter of the particle that we had all the way on the right-hand side a moment ago, times our expression for the Reynolds number, which is the diameter of the particle, times the velocity over the kinematic viscosity to the one half, times the kinematic viscosity over the diffusivity, to the one third, and we can simplify this a little bit. So this just becomes KC equals 0 0.6 times DAB to the two thirds divided by the kinematic viscosity to the one sixth times the velocity to the one half divided by the diameter of the particle to the one half. And the nice thing here is that this, right, or these two are, both, are fluid properties. We don't really have a lot of control over those, but these two are tunable parameters. 
right? We have velocity, right? Or flow velocity, and we have the particle diameter and we can manipulate both of those. And so if you look at this, right? That means to increase KC, which is often what we wanna do, what can we do? Well, we can either increase the fluid velocity and that probably makes sense, right? So let's think about this physically for just a moment that if we had, if we had a particle, right? And, you know, it had some fixed diffusion layer thickness, right? So let's think about this in terms of, let's say U1. Well, now if we had some value of the velocity much greater than this, well, what happens here? If you really wanna think about it in terms of a force, well, when the fluid is coming at the particle, the faster it's coming, the closer it can get to the particle before it diverts away. And if that's the case, our diffusion layer is gonna shrink for you two. And remember, right, Kc was equal to the diffusion coefficient over the diffusion layer thickness. So when we increase the velocity, hopefully it makes sense then that we shrink the diffusion layer thickness and, um, and we're able to increase Kc. The second way to do this is also by uh, reducing the particle size. Right, this makes sense from this equation, but physically it also hopefully makes some kind of sense because again, let's start with this particle that we already have where we have a very big particle with some initial diffusion layer thickness. Well, if we have a much smaller particle, it influences the flow less than a large particle would. So the fluid wouldn't even know that it got or it was approaching a small particle until much, much later. And the result of that as well is that at the same velocity, the diffusion layer thickness would get closer. And so both of these approaches, whether it's increasing the velocity or reducing the particle diameter, they both compress the diffusion layer and increase and increase Kc. So what's the extent then if we can manipulate Kc that we can affect the reaction rate constant? Because if you look at this, you might actually think, well, wait a minute, um, minus Ra prime versus let's say the velocity, right? That it should just keep going up. But that can't happen because at some point, kinetics will take over just like we talked about a minute ago, right? In our initial case, right? We compared where Kc versus Kr. And we said, well, there's cases where that's true and the reaction controls. And there are cases where this is true and mass transport controls. So the reality here is that if we actually were to look at the shape of this plot, right? And let's, instead of just doing the velocity, let's include our particle diameter as well, right? Because we know that we can change either one of those. That initially increasing velocity or reducing the particle diameter is going to increase the reaction rate. But then at some point we're gonna become reaction limited, right? So down here, right, we're definitely diffusion limited. And you know, our reaction rate constant is basically the mass transport coefficient. And up here, we are reaction limited. And our reaction rate constant is equal to, is equal to KR. And we've solved for both of those cases, right? But I want you to remember that, that RA double prime was equal to KR KC times CA over KR plus KC. And in this region, in the lower left here, we're diffusion limited. Our expression here will simplify as we've done above. And the same thing here where we're totally reaction limited. And quite frankly, a lot of reacting systems fall into these two extremes. 
but there are some that fall in here where you're in this mixed control region and you actually need to solve the rate law using all of that information. And there are also cases where remember this KR, for our simple example here, we said that KR only had the reaction. But remember, we have cases that also have adsorption and desorption and other things. So our expression for the rate law can become pretty complicated if we start to combine the things that we've done uh, up until now with this. Now we're gonna solve cases like this, but not now. That's a little bit too much for us to do at this point in our class. So hopefully today you've got a little bit of an appreciation for how mass external mass transport can affect the reaction rate. And as we move forward, we're going to systematically make things more complex that we're going to consider reactions where there's external diffusion, just like this one, just like today. We're also going to consider cases where there's internal mass transport, and we have to think about diffusion in pores, because remember, we assume today that we are dealing with hard spheres with no internal porosity. And then there are uh, problems that we'll solve that have both that are active, and we have to figure out um, which one dominates, or we have to figure out how we can manipulate our rate law, depending on, on which one of these is controlling. So we're going to continue to do that as we move forward and consider how mass transport affects these catalytic reactors.